and a happy new year. All right, that's it. No more beer for any of you. Entertainment industry is a seven hundred plus billion dollar a year business in the United States alone, or somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, depending on who you talk to, because of the economy, obviously. And Los Angeles is the creative capital. For the past thirteen years, we've brought you interesting and informative guests who are among the industry's movers, shakers, and decision makers in a weekly, unprecedented, unvarnished look into the behind the scenes the record, film, and television industries, as well as the broader scope of the body politics on how things really work in aggregate in the entertainment business, and with respect to the political season, how the shifting, prevailing, and sometimes howling winds of Washington politics affect all of us in the entertainment industry, and I suspect that uh, we're going to see some of that in the coming years. Good afternoon and welcome to Sam Brown's For the Record. I'm Sam Brown, your host on this one-of-a-kind world internet-wide radio talk show. This afternoon is the last show of 2008, and we've got yet another fantastic show for you, because we're more than just talk. And we welcome you every Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. right here, live from our Studio B. Our co-hosts have the afternoon off. They're spending it, of course, with their family this holiday weekend, and as I've been saying for the last three weeks, or uh, two and a half, yeah, two weeks, I'm here, and I'm here live, because I'm the boss, and as I've said, it costs to be boss, and I, I treat everybody as good or better than I would like to have myself treated in similar circumstances, so they get the time off. Sean Novak and Carlton Murray are here holding the fort, keeping an eye on me and making sure everything goes well. All right, so let me ask this um, rhetorical question, which really is not a rhetorical question. Actually, why so much music you hear sucks is the subtitle to the book Dirty Little Secrets of the Record Business by Hank Bordowitz. Now, we've been talking in our promoing about having Hank on, but he's on the East Coast where he lives. And uh, and I read the book quite a while ago, and uh, and I had to go through it again last night just to get up on, on some of the things Hank was talking about. And um, it's easy to say, I suppose, as the late Dr. Hunter S. Thompson said, that Quote, and I love this 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 uh, saying of Hunter Thompson's. The music business is a cruel money trench, a long plastic hallway 
where thieves and pimps run free and good men and women, he didn't put the women in there, I did, good men and women die like dogs. There's also a negative side. Unquote. But Thompson never did offer a solution. Off Author Hank Bordowitz does offer one in his book, Dirty Little Secrets of the Record Business, Why So Much Music You Hear Sucks. And though Bordowitz talks about the, quote, greed, stagnation, and short-sightedness that has left the multi-billion dollar music business ailing and listeners' ears hungry for something better, unquote, he also says that there is, quote, more music available, more good music available than ever before, unquote. I agree with that. But it's just harder to find. That's our show for the day. The wise and the bad and the ugly and the where to find the good music. The book, Dirty Little Secrets of the Record Business. And we will be right back. By the by, Dave Bant, if you're waiting to hear Dave, Dave is gone for the holidays. He'll be back next week as well. So we'll begin with our program right after this. You are listening to Sam Brown's For the Record on KPFK 90.7 FM Los Angeles and 98.7 FM Santa Barbara. Join us Wednesday afternoon for a series explaining the lives of farm workers in California from statehood to the present. That's Pastors of Plenty Wednesday at 2. I was trolling the Internet, as I do every day, looking for um, updates for, for this story that we're, we're doing today. And on the 17th of December, I ran into this article um, on Hypebot called Four Dirty Little Secrets of Music 2.0. And I'm just going to go through these four things, and then we're, we're going to jump into uh, Hank Borderwitz's book. But this is what that it's short, and it's a short article, so so don't worry about it. Um, the first dirty little secret of music 2.0, and I suppose it's internet, is big checkbooks still trump big ideas. Just ask any startup. You'd think that the major labels would embrace every great idea they could find to help save the struggling business. Nope. Labels are inundated with so many great ideas and are so desperate to help their bottom lines that the only ideas they take seriously are attached to fat checkbooks. Number two, every time music is licensed to an ad-supported music 2.0 service, they're probably breaking a contract. How many record label or publishing contracts do you know that say, quote, it's okay to pay me a tiny fraction of projected ad revenue every time my song is played or downloaded, unquote. Number three, you can't do it yourself. You can't do it yourself. There are not enough hours in the day to return emails from all of your Facebook friends, update your dates on eventful uh, post and eventful is a web website, by the by, for those of you who don't know. Post new photos on Flickr. Edit the expletives out of that backstage video before posting it on YouTube and still find the time to write songs, record them, and then play them live. I would say you should also rehearse and then play them live. I would add that in there. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a team to build a career. Start building one today. And number four, even after the FCC banned payola, indies still have no chance at radio. Little has changed. Indie music still has almost no chance of making it onto commercial radio. Radio programmers are too often sheep, playing fewer and fewer new records, and the vast majority still come from their pals at the major labels. And with that being the fourth, we're going to turn to Hank Bordowitz, who's online, 
and uh, okay. and Taka, how are you, Hank? Let me just give you your introduction and your props. Uh, <laughs> you, he, Hank is a veteran music journalist, former recording artist, so he, so he knows he's been on that side of the glass, music business consultant, adjunct professor of the music business, and the author of seven critically hailed books, including Bad Moon Rising, The Unauthorized History of Creedence Clearwater Revival, Every Little Thing Gonna Be All Right, The Bob Marley Reader, Turning Points of Rock and Roll, and Billy Joel, The Life and Times of an Angry Young Man. Good afternoon, Hank. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm great. Um, how's everything out in L.A.? Everything in, in L.A. is doing well, thank you. It, the appearance is well, but that is the operative word, of course, is appearance. Well, and as, as we all know, perception is everything. Exactly. I've always said one of my sayings for almost 30 years has been money doesn't make the world go round. It's the perception of having it that makes the world go round. And we're seeing that in the crisis, that there are people that looked like they had money that obviously didn't, and some who did have a great deal who don't have a great deal anymore. So it's always the perception. Let me ask you about the. I just read uh, from an article called Four Dirty Little Secrets of Music 2.0 on Hyperbot. I read that. Uh, Hypebot. Um, and the last one, because you talk about this, there's a couple of chapters about payola. And oh, yeah. they say indies still have no chance at radio. Why is that so? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that, really. Uh, first off, it's important to realize that radio doesn't matter as much anymore. Mm -hmm. Radio is just not as important as it once was because, as you said, in the, as it said in the article, they're reducing playlists. Playlists are getting thinner and thinner, and the kind of music that's getting played is being more and more mainstream. So mm -hmm. it's not a way that people... I, I don't know. I'm, I'm an old guy, so... You know, I remember I would listen to the radio to discover new music, mm -hmm. and my children don't have that uh, ability, don't have that luxury, um, because not no really new music is played on the radio. Right, um, it's all the same old stuff. So, um, you know, we have to go all elsewhere to discover new music. But, but, but the converse of that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, I was going to say, um, let me just interject there. When you say the same old stuff, most of the people who use that expression, including me, are over the age of 30. Uh, when you listen to the conversations of 12-year-olds and, and, you know, 15-year-olds and 18-year-olds, they don't usually use that expression, the same old stuff. That's because the same old stuff is new to them. Uh, I don't know how much, how true that is anymore. I mean, I'm, I've been teaching college for about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And I am amazed. One of the first questions I asked, my, I asked, asked, oh, yeah, I'm a great writer. Wonderful use of the English language. One of the first things I ask my students is, what radio station do you listen to, if indeed you still listen to radio? And a lot of them do not listen to radio anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them have just given up on radio. And those that do, about 50% of them, listen to the classic rock station. Right. It's one of the most... You, think you and I were listening to when we were their age. Right. And you, you gave us a breakdown, I'm looking for it, of... Uh the most uh, prominent uh, genres of music, and I do believe I saw classic rock as leading the pack there. It's way up there. Yeah. Um, you know, it's so... I, I, I was pretty amazed by that until I found the two things that I used to, in fact, verify that and with the um, information I put in the book. Mm hmm So, a lot, I mean... I have a 15-year-old niece and a 13-year-old niece, and, you know, when I ask them what they listen to, it's often, well, the 15-year-old is now into her classic rock phase, and the 13-year-old is saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a little too old for Hannah Montana and Britney Spears now, right? and so I'm trying to find something new, and I'm not really finding it on the radio. 
So, you know, it's, it's radio is digging a hole for itself right now. But then again, a lot of businesses are doing that. Right. And, and, and I was, uh, talking to a friend of mine, uh, at dinner, uh, a couple of weeks ago and I was saying, um, how long do you think it's going to be before the record industry, uh, goes to Congress looking for a bailout? <laughs> we, we were musing and, um, and I suppose there are some people in the powers that be that are considering that. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, I'm going to quote <clears throat> uh, something that you wrote here. The stakes have become so high, the stockholders so demanding that there's no longer time to develop artists, cultivate sounds, or even create trends. It has all become very reactive between this and the regular personnel bloodbaths used to keep the bottom line down. The glamour of A&R was, has waned considerably. So being able to, uh, you know, you combine that with the fact that there are probably a hundred times more music uh, and artists trying to get in than there were 20 years ago because of the easy accessibility it is to make a CD. A&R people do not have the time to go through all of that material. Oh, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I'm very friendly with a lot of A&R people. And that's one of their big complaints is, you know, they're as frustrated trying to find new music as we are, and then they have the added frustration of trying to uh, sell it to their corporate masters. Exactly. um, Who don't want to hear it. And and you may and you make reference to uh, a meeting um, with Polly Anthony walking in, and yeah. and, and and making <laughs> a remark about and don't sign any more acts like Mo M O E oh. right. Do you remember that? Yep. In fact, uh, my buddy Mike Kaplan is still angry at me about that because I insinuated that his records don't sell, which is uh-huh. absolutely wrong. They do sell very well. It's just. You know, 95% of the records released don't sell. So, you know, that was more to what I was alluding. Um, and, and I've been saying that figure for years, that 90, 95, 90, I, was, I added up as high as 97% of records don't sell, and meaning that they don't even break even, and that includes independence. Well, I mean, I, I quoted this thing, Ed Christman up at um, Billboard every mm. year, around this, coming up in a few weeks, in fact, does this thing where he goes through the uh, sound scan numbers Mm -hmm. and says, okay, last year, and by the way, you were correct that there are a lot more records being released. About 10 years ago, even, there was only 30,000 records a year being released. Now it's up to uh, almost 70,000. In fact, you're on top of that. You're right. Yeah, you are correct about that, and it's very hard, you know, to gatekeep that. Mm -hmm. But what Ed did is he came, he went through the figures and he said, well, you know, this num- many num- this many um, recordings sold um, over a million, this many recordings. And he came up to the figure like, one thing he came up with is 50% of all record sales come from 0.2, that's 0.2% right. percent of the um, recordings released commercially right so that's i mean that's pretty that's like 120 um recordings supporting the entire um business Mm -hmm. so that's that's a pretty scary thing i mean how many other how many other businesses can say that about their products right 120 products are supporting the entire industry Uh, uh you know i used to say that all the time um years because that's been that's pretty much been it. I I would say, how many industries do you know um, are are going to um, sustain themselves with a batting average below a hundred? Um, and today, and you pointed out in your book, I suspect it's even more. You say, and I'm quoting here: many of the majors will not sign artists who have not previously sold 20,000 units of a record, either via an independent record company or on their own. That is, and that figure has probably 
um, gotten higher, and there are other things. They have to have a story. Mm-hmm. You know, they have to have something, some unique selling point. And what I'm thinking these days is, once you get to that point, if you do the math, what do you really need the major labels for? Mm-hmm. And, um, and I've heard that. Uh, most people will tell you that are seeking major uh, label deals is that what they want is global um, promotion. They want to be able to tour the world, the world to know they're out there, and leapfrog, literally leapfrog over all of the independent artists that just slam their stuff on the net and hope and pray and cross their fingers that somebody will discover them. And they... Well, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go. I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, they feel that um, with a major deal, um, if they do the record right and and they come up with a hit or two, that's real. They could run with that for a couple of dozen years or so. That's absolutely right. Also, the problem there being that only you know, again, you know, one or two percent of the musicians out there can do that, mm. whereas. You know, this is a unique time to find an audience uh-huh. if you know how to build it. Right. And the tools are are out there now. The tools, I mean, I'm not just talking about um, Facebook or, um, you know, um, MySpace, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I'm just here in a car with my wife. I heard your wife. Technology, yes, MySpace. Uh-huh. There's, there's a lot more to it than that. Um and a clever manager mm. can take care of that. And what I'm seeing in the future, one of the potential futures of the music business, and the music business has several, but of the recorded content business, is that managers are going to become the people who are going to meet them and making the deals internationally, and the aggregators are going to be, you know, help, you know, eventually starting to really, you know, dig into the products that they aggregate. And saying, well, this is, we're seeing some action on this. Why? And when they figure out why, trying to build that and figure out how to do more. So, you know, there's, there's, it's a brave new world out there right now. It's, it's a very exciting time, really, to be in the music business. One, um, one of the things about your book that I really liked, and, and I will tell you in a minute, uh, the one thing I had, uh, and it's a personal thing of mine, uh, as one of the reasons, although you did give, you did genuflect towards it. Um, but you talk about, uh, something that I think is extremely important because I think we've gotten so far down the line where, where musicians and artists think that if you do music, uh, if you're a musician and you're, you want to be an artist, that you should just do the art and don't worry about making any money. And I think that's bull. I think that it's a profession. I think it, it, all the things that go into any other profession, you wouldn't want to go to a doctor or a surgeon who never went to medical school. And, um, the more I hear, uh, the more I'm able to tell that so many musicians and artists to get today have no musical education. But we'll get to that. I want to talk about what you, and I'm going to quote you from the book here. Where, cause I did not know this, but, um, but you said the Bible refers to musicians playing in the courts of King David and Solomon. And one would imagine that such performers would get paid. A millennium, a millennium after that, the Greek theater used music and paid the musicians who played there. So music became a profession sometime before the common era. That's at least 2,500 and probably more like 4,000 years of professional music. So musicians need to get paid. Is that not correct, Hank? Um, musicians. And artists. And artists. And they do get paid. And, you know, they don't get paid nearly enough. They don't get paid what they're worth, certainly. Nor do writers, by the way. Nor do college professors. Um, but, you know, they do get paid. And policemen and fire, firemen would say they don't get paid either, uh, <clears throat> as well as they should be. Right. Why do you think... And I, I agree with that, by the way. <clears throat> Why do yeah. you think that songwriters, and now comes my own personal thing because I am a songwriter, 
Fortunately, I've done very well. Thank you very much. But why do songwriters, and as long as I've been in this business, they've always been the bottom of the food chain and the least respected, and yet without them, there are no songs to sing, and without songs to sing, everything goes away. And uh, why is that? Well, that, that's, you see, I, I call this book Dirty Little Secrets of the Record Business because that's another secret. It's not a dirty one either. It's, it's one of my favorites, though, especially when I'm teaching students. Right. As a songwriter, you may be, again, perceived as being on the bottom of the food chain. But you know, and I know, that if you have a hit song, uh-huh. it, keeps, it keeps on giving. Because publishing has been, since, since the days of Gutenberg, publishing has been where the money's at in the music business. If you have a hit song, you got to repeat that caveat because everybody thinks that if you own the copyright or publishing, which is one and the same of a song, you're going to get wealthy. But not if you're a part of the 95% of, of records who sell uh, CDs, who sells less than 10,000 copies uh, uh, on a single, uh, on their first run, which most of them do. Well, unless, of course, you're very canny about how you promote your songs. I know an artist, for example, who, you know, is a self-funded artist, and her records are made um, at the, um, you know, permission of her fans. Her fans send a certain amount of money before she records an album, because she has recorded several albums, and they've all been consistently good and consistently what they want to hear. But she right. also manages to get her songs on television shows. Right. You mentioned her in the book as well. Right. So, yeah, so Jenny does that, and she does a very wonderful job at it. But I'm talking about the the tens of thousands of of uh, artists and musicians and, and songwriters um, who are out there. Who don't and who who have not and don't get paid. I mean, you were you also mentioned something, uh, and I'm trying to remember what it, the context was about artists like Bo Diddley, um, who oh. and and you mentioned something about another artist that you said they they had a hit record and the guy said and we're back to flipping burgers. I think there was a whole chapter on that. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that was um, a bunch of rap artists, and that was that was not even. Specific artists. That was a whole, a whole, a veritable whole of plethora artists. of rap I mean, artists. That, that's why this. That's why this guy left his A and R position. He left this, you know, gig that was paying him, you know, a quarter of a million dollars a year, because he just couldn't stand what was happening to his artists anymore. Um, and that's a lack of education. That's. I mean, that's one of the reasons I like. Uh, for the past ten years, I've been teaching the music business and music at schools. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, that's one of the reasons I do it is because, you know, part, part at least to avoid people being ripped off. Right. Um, and, yeah, the business will still do that to you if you let it, and there's no excuse for letting it anymore because this information is now freely available, whereas when Bo Diddley signed with Chess, and Arc Music, and they took all his publishing. It wasn't. When John Fogarty signed with Fantasy and part of his contract, you know, one paragraph in there said, you know, all of your publishing up to this point belongs to us. Right. You know, if they went it, they showed it to a lawyer. Happened to Sue Cook's father was a lawyer. Um, and as close a thing back in those days as there was to an entertainment lawyer, he worked for the, um, the Oakland Raiders uh, for one of his clients. So he understood entertainment contracts, and you know he looked at it and he said, "Yes, it's a contract," and they signed it. And it was, you know, like one of I sent this contract, and I got it to my lawyer, and I said, "Is this really as bad as I think it is?" Mm-hmm. And my lawyer came back with, "Yes, this is the Stephen King novel of recording contracts." <laughs> and I read right. it, and the small hairs stood up on the back of my neck. Right. Um, and and so, and you make a point of of telling us that. Um, most recording contracts have some kind of clause in them that literally uh, tells you or asks you or demands 
that you usurp your constitutional rights. Most people don't know that copyright and intellectual property is in the Constitution, Article 1. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it says, uh, you know, uh, give me your copyrights. Yet, they, uh, you know, in the business, copyrights are known as property, literally property, like real estate. And I ask, you know, the classes that I teach and my, my students, would you give away property? Just here. You, you want it here. Yeah, you know, it's, it's why they, you know, intellectual property has become a big buzzword now. So hopefully down the road, you know, people are going to start getting wiser to this. And I think people are getting wiser to this. Well, but I also, yeah. Also, they want this so bad. Yeah, that's you know, that, and and people the people doing that so know bad. that, right? So you know, what are you willing to give up for it? Right. And you know, oh, I mean, we could go so many ways with this conversation. Right now. Well, I, I've always said, I've always said that um, you know, if the song is really, if people really believe that song is a hit, you can negotiate. If they're just trying to build their own personal catalog. And you're a sucker, and uh, and you want it so bad, then uh, you know they'll be the first one to tell you, okay, walk away from the table. But they're not going to tell you that if what they what they have, they think they have, is a an unpolished diamond, a diamond with a little bit of mud on it. They're going to go, no, because you'll take it down the street. Somebody will take half, and they're going to clean up. Okay, let's talk turkey. And apart from everything else, and this goes back to something you were saying earlier. That's one of the reasons that an artist should have somebody with some business savvy in their corner, be it an attorney, be it a manager, you know, be it a concerned parent who knows his way around the music business or her way. Um, uh-huh. Because, you know, it's easy for somebody who doesn't know to get caught up in this. All right, we could- it could be very ugly. Well, especially if you have one hit, it, it could be ugly. All right. Uh, uh, Hank Bordowitz is the author of the book, Dirty Little Secrets of the Record Business, Why So Much Music You Hear Sucks. And when we come back, we're going to bring in Moses Avalon, who is on phone, and uh, he'll join the conversation. And I want to begin by something else that I have often said. And I, I've gotten into this argument so many times where artists or managers say, well, the reason the song didn't happen was because the label didn't promote it or there was no promotion. That's the first place they go to blame. And I have said that all the money, all the payola in the world cannot make people go out and buy something they don't like because the song ain't there. And you talk about that in your book. We're going to talk about it a little bit right here when Hank Bordowitz, author of Dirty Little Secrets of the Record Business, comes back. And joining us will be Moses Avalon. I'm Sam Brown. You're listening to Sam Brown's For the Record. We'll be right back. Greetings, I'm Chuck Foster. Join me today at 3 o'clock for Reggae Central, two hours of ska, rock steady, dub, dance hall, and lots of roots and culture. That's Reggae Central, today at 3 o'clock. This is Ray Parker Jr. If it's something strange in your music career, who you gonna tune into? Sam Brown's For the Record on KPFK. And we're back with Hank Bordowitz, who is author of Dirty Little Secrets of the Record Business, and Moses Avalon is he on? Mo, here, Mo you're there. Where are you? In Barstow? Here, huh? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Are you in Barstow? Am I where? <laughs> Barstow. 
no, no, no. I'm at the uh, Marriott uh, Desert Resort in uh, Desert Hot Springs. Oh, I thought you would be driving back by now. Okay. Well, so did I, but you know how that works out when you have kids and family and all that other stuff. And happy holidays, holy days to you as well. Uh, have you been able to hear the conversation up to now? I have not, so you have to fill me in a little bit. Oh, okay. We're getting ready to talk about, uh, uh, payola. I used to get into these arguments, and I know you and I have, have talked about it, uh, not necessarily argued about it, but just talked about it, that all the promotion, a gazillion dollars worth of promotions cannot make a record a hit, which is something that most managers and artists, uh, blame when their their record, their song doesn't happen, and it it just doesn't happen, the first people that get blamed is the promotion part uh, department of the label and the indie promoters. And I'd like to just read something out of the book where Hank says, all the promotion in the world, all the payola in the world, and all the airplay in the world will not turn a terrible record that no one wants to hear into a hit. As Dick Clark said, and I'm quoting, uh, you quoting Dick Clark, you can't make a record a hit by, by playing the hell out of it. Why isn't it that, that more people don't know that? Are you asking me? Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm asking possible, both of you. It's possible that when you say most people, I assume you're talking about, uh, the powers that be at record yes. companies who yes. allocate this money, right? Is that what you mean by nobody? I, I'm saying, Everybody, from the powers that be to the artists themselves who think that all they have to do is get the right promotion, get enough money thrown up uh, against their product, and it'll be a hit. Well, here's the thing. In an extreme case, that's probably true. But the reality is, you know, terrible songs don't become hits. No. But you can't, you see, when, once you shift it over a little bit and say, well, what about a mediocre song or a, a slightly better than average song? Can you make that a hit by throwing tons of promotion at it? Then the equation starts to kind of fall apart. Because you can make a mediocre song a hit if you throw enough money at it. That might not be a hit for long, but, I mean, I'm sure all of us here could sit here and, and quote songs that became huge hits that were, you know, the songs were okay. They weren't really that great, and the artist wasn't that great. So why did they become a hit? They became a hit because someone threw a shitload of money at it. Uh, yeah. Let's watch our language. i got to write oh, that up. i got to write sorry. you up. Okay. It's like a it's like a turntable hit. Right. The, and and they know, used to call that. A song that gets just played to death on the radio and you know people hear it on the radio and it may not it may be you know so transparent that you know if you don't turn the radio off, which is all that matters to radio. Radio is not there to entertain. You radio is there to sell advertising time and to keep you tuned in. Right. So if you're on the radio, if the song is not turning people off, if people are not, you know, turning their radio to another station when they hear this song, then for radio, that's good. And so you have songs that, you know, get played to death and people get their, um, you know, ASCAP and BMI money, but they don't sell a whole lot of records. Harry Fox isn't lighting up over them. And, and I always said that, you know, you got your turntable hits, which are records that get a whole lot of spins because a lot of money is thrown at them and uh, never sell anything. And then you have what I called back in the 80s during the disco era, um, disco or dance club hits, music that gets played all the time in the clubs, and everybody jumps up and dances to them, but they don't run out of the club the ne uh, that night and uh, they're standing in line in Walmarts to go buy it. Nor could you probably get that record at Walmarts. Well, I'm just using Walmart because I'm looking at Walmart in your book when you talk about pop music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, this is very, very true. But you know, you know what I'm saying. It gets promoted um, in in all the clubs, but nobody goes out and buys it. They just they just like to dance to it. So the labels think that because everybody's responding to it in the clubs, that it's it's a hit. It needs more money thrown at it. And it's really, you know, as Barry Gordy, who arguably built the 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 most incredible stable of writers, maybe next to Don, or even in, in front of Don Kirshner, uh, who had people like Carol King, Jerry Goffin, and and those those people, uh, who used to say it's the song 
the song makes the artist and not the other way around because the first thing you notice about the artist is their song and you don't even know who the artist is. And that's why well, I also I, noticed their voice and stuff. I mean, you know, that that's also kind of fallacious. Uh, exactly. They people don't really care. They don't even care about how old they are. What they care about is the song cuz that's the part that emotionally grabs people as they use the word hook um when they first hear it and it's the song it's it's totally the song all right let let's talk about the, the uh internet uh cuz you cover a lot of territory in this book uh and and I think it's it's fabulous and I, and I just want to say you know I read it uh, a couple of years back and I reread it last night to uh just you know refresh my memory on things and and I forgot how good of a read this is. So uh, you know, if you're in the the record business or actually in any entertainment business, I would highly recommend Dirty Little Secrets of the Record Business uh, because the way you break it down is really very interesting. And there are things in here you're going to learn about. Talk about uh, Hank and and uh, comment on it, Moses. Uh, the internet and why is it that what we see as so far as sales is concerned on the internet mirrors what we were seeing with uh uh you know in 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 retail stores is it easier what are my mirrors in other words the amount of music sold on the internet is not any more quote unquote uh than the CDs that are being sold in retail in fact the internet, and based on the numbers, has not taken over uh, the amount of uh, sales of music. As a matter of fact, I think the last survey I saw it was something like seventeen percent, maybe thirteen percent. Well, first of all, first of all, you have to qualify when you say internet sales. You're referring to downloads. Downloads. Okay, well that's the difference because Amazon sells a boatload of records, a boatload of CDs. So uh, I think it's important that we differentiate uh, in order to you know, uh, workshop your question here. You're talking about sales of downloads versus sales of physical products. Right. Okay. Hank? Yeah. Um, I thought Moses was going to go on about that, which I would have loved to. I can. I I, I didn't want to step on Hank's toes. You know, he's he's the big guest here. I'm just a, I'm just a, I'm just a sub. You're just a guy at the Marriott. (laughs) (laughs) Sitting around in his underwear uh, saying, uh, y- you know, turn it back to uh, the Patriots. Far, <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> and this, by the way, I gave myself a new car for Christmas, and I strongly advise anyone who's interested, who's ever been interested in buying a BMW, to get their butt down to any BMW dealership. They're basically giving them away two for one. Really? Yeah. Uh, oh, that's interesting uh, to know. Okay. I wish, I wish, I wish. Well, maybe this, maybe this bit of promotion will get the book to the point where I can do that. Um, let's see. The internet is still in its infancy. It still, you know, hasn't figured out what it wants to be when it grows up. Mm-hmm. The internet is, um, you know, people are predicting the death of the CD, and I don't see that happening anytime, really, really soon. Neither do I. Uh, neither do I. I. I've said it a hundred times. I keep, I keep getting flack in my, my, my blog whenever I say oh, CDs are going to be around for a long, long time. And there's always some wackos that come out of the woodwork who say, "Yeah, what happened to eight-track tapes?" And I'm like, "All right, well, clearly you do not understand what's going on if you if you compare CDs to eight-track tapes." Right. On the on the other hand, I just because uh, I'm going to be moving from Illinois, hopefully back to New York very soon. Um, I just. Uh, sold all of my CDs with the pro- with the proviso that they digitized them, and I'm going to be getting a terabyte hard drive with all of my uh, music on it. So, you know, there's that too. But there are people who want that physical product in their hands, but there's also people who just want to be able to hear this song on their iPod when, or their MP3 player whenever they want to hear it. Exactly. So they'll be willing to either pay the 99 cents or deal with um, the P2P situation, which has gotten a lot more difficult over the last few 
years. I, I don't know. Moses, have you noticed that? Yeah, I actually follow this up pretty closely, and I agree with you. CDs are, are, are going to be around for a long time. Um, uh, digital sales, much like cable TV, didn't kill the, the film industry or the television industry. Digital sales is going to be a new, another avenue to sell products. Are, are we going to see a drop in CD sales? Well, of course. But it's natural. There's a new medium out there, and everyone's excited about it, so people are purchasing off it. But purchasing music off the Internet is very expensive. Uh, 99 cents for a song, I think, is very expensive. And subscription services, I think, are very expensive. To pay 15 or $16 a month you know, for all the music you can listen to, but none of the music you can own starts to add up over time. So CDs are still the cheapest way to buy music, and, and because of that, they'll be, and for a lot of other technical reasons, they'll be around for, for a long time to come. But I think the, the, the dirty secret of the music business, um, which is our topic today, is that, is that the music business in general is having a hard time. And I don't see it that way at all. I, I read the annual reports of, of every label and their parent companies and all the little uh, investment banking companies that invest in these companies. Uh, the music business is doing just fine. CD sales are, are off, or dropped rather, but so what? CD sales are down 30% compared to 2002, but they're up compared to 1991. So uh, what, are we, what are we, when we talk about the music business going to hell in a handbasket, I'm not really sure what people are talking about. If you're not talking about CD sales, then you're not talking about anything, because digital is up, licensing is up, concerts are up, everything is up. And, Hank, you made a point of talking about the gloom and doomers uh, who've been saying that since 1941, that uh, the, the, yeah. the end is nigh for the record business. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, when you got to the um, Depression, just from a historical point, uh, you go to the Depression and music sales go from like 112 million units to 5 million units during the 1930s. And then by 1941, with the... Uh, beginning of the war, they're back up, you know, through the roof, 250 million units. And now right. we're talking in terms of 12 billion units. I, I, so, I, did a, I did an article on this recently where um, they talked about Black Friday and how music sales were very down because of Black Friday. The article, clearly a very tech-biased article, also in the same article mentioned that Xbox sales were through the roof. And the number one item that is bundled with Xbox is rock band. And rock band involves the licensing of, you know, several dozen top pop songs. So it's very skewed when you read about music sales down, you know, Black Friday was terrible for the music business. They're talking strictly about CD sales and not even CD sales. They're talking strictly about new releases on major labels at top line prices. Oh, those are down. So what? Who cares? That's true. Um, absolutely. And... You know, part of the thing with Rock Band, with, you know, the video games in general, I mean, you know, Grand Theft Auto, you play the radio in your car, and you can get, what is it, uh, um, I think the latest one has 70-odd songs in, built into the game, and each of those gets paid, you know, a, um, a mechanical royalty every time the game gets pressed, every time a game gets sold. And so, you know, there are all sorts of outlets now for music that nobody dreamed of. You know, I mean, think about it. A century and a quarter ago, there were no recordings. Nobody knew what a recording sounded like. Nobody exactly. knew what the music sounded like. You know, but even 10 years ago, nobody dreamed about, you know, 70 games, you know, collecting royalties on 70 games on a, you know, 70 songs on a video game. And also, Nobody, you know, you're absolutely right. But also, you're talking if you if you talk to people like Amoeba Records, they'll tell you that sales are up. So the only people who are experiencing music sales being down are new artists on RIA affiliated labels being sold at top line prices in major outlets. Those sales are down. All other sales are up. All right, let me, uh, let's go to the phones. We've got people who are calling in. Um, we, we have time to take one or two calls. The number 818-985-5735. 818-985-5735. If you have a questions, I, I, I don't have time. We're running out of time. Don't have time for comments, but I do have time for some quick questions. 818-985-5735. Okay. Um, 
let's talk about real quickly, Hank and Moses, uh, about advertising or promotion on the internet. You can't just throw your your CD up on the internet and exp- expect people to find it, can you? You can't just throw a CD into a store and expect people to find it. You've got to promote any product that's out there because otherwise, how is anyone going to know about it? Exactly. Of course, with music, you've got the the thing that the live show is your best performance, you know, your best uh, promotion. And it's interesting because that just feeds in a loop because the show feeds the um, the CD sales, CD sales feed the show, you know, people going to the show. So. You know, that's, that's one of the great things historically about the music business. Exactly. It's, we've got all these great things that build on each other. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, you can't, you know, you can't, it's no different than saying, well, I'm going to put a CD in a store and uh, hope that people know where it is and know where, to look, know where to look for it, know where to find it and buy it. You have to do promotion on the Internet. The, the double-edged sword of the Internet is um, it is a lot easier and a lot cheaper to promote things on the internet than it is to promote things in the brick and mortar world. The the double edged sword of that though is you have to know how to do it. And investing the time and the effort and the money to figure out how to do it, it acts on such a back a little bit, but once you know how to do it, it, it pays off in space. And then you can do it for other artists as well. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, you've got to I mean I get maybe 80 emails a day from music from musicians. I mean, some of them are reaching me through their promotion companies or publicity companies. Some of them are reaching to me just by themselves. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you get on a mailing list, you'll get that. Um, you know, artists just seek me out because they see the books, and I get a lot of that. But, you know, I'm sure that if they, if they have a sign-up sheet at their shows, those same emails are going to their fans. Mm-hmm. And and one of the things that uh, you know, which is why I wanted to just bring this in, um, is that you hear so many artists say, "Well, I can make music music on the internet," and I say, "Okay, uh, you get through with your CD, and you you know you get your thousand fifteen hundred units coming in from uh, uh, Oasis or um, you know wherever." And um, now, what are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to put it up on it on my website, and people will find well, people will find it because it's great. Not so. Now, if there's more to it than build it, and they will come. Right. Um, you know, you've got to you've got to guide them there. And you know, one of the next great frontier on the internet, as far as I'm concerned, is gatekeeping. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got some early efforts at it. You've got some very successful ones. Pandora is something I'm very very fond of in terms of. It's the first place I've discovered music that I have been unaware of in a decade. You know, it's just, I put in a name, I put in something I like, and they give me just tons and tons of other stuff, and it's just brilliant. That's, it's, that's similar. It's, yeah, and it's and brilliant. Analyze and analyze your taste and then find other things that are similar. It's, it's the way to go. It's brilliant. Um, and these guys, I mean, they did it. They, they found this, this nexus between science and art that's almost kind of scary, um, where they programmed in the elements of the song and the elements of the artist that, you know, each, for each song and each artist, and then they find stuff that has the similar algorithm, and if you don't like it, you say, I don't like this. And it starts doing the math about why you don't like this music, and it starts feeding you music that you will like. Well, and I, eventually, if you train it well enough, it just gives you all this music that you like. Well, I've always been one that said uh, science is art, and art is science. Uh, form is function, and form is formula. I mean, no matter how you can't you can't just not say. You know, people say to me oftentimes dealing with songs. Well, what comes from the heart? And I say blood, nothing more, nothing less. Don't, don't, don't believe the other stuff that you hear. Uh, Hank Bordowitz is the author of the book, Dirty Little Secrets of the Record Business. I recommend that you get it. Moses, what are you plugging this week? Your book, your workshop. 
Well, I, the, I guess the workshop, my workshop is now online, and anybody can visit it at confessionsworkshop.com. Confessions. With, with an app, plural, confessions. Anybody can send me an email or get on my mailing list by just going to mosesavalon.com. And starting and beginning of next year, there'll be the 10th anniversary edition of my first book, Confessions of a Record Producer, which will be uh, coming out not just as a book, but as an iPod app. Outstanding. And Hank, you got Excellent. an email website? Um, www.borderwitz.com. Spell Borderwitz. Um, Borderwitz, B O R. B O R, that's true. B O R D O W I T Z. Right. And uh, again, the book is Dirty Little Secrets of the Record Business. Yeah, go ahead. We got to tell you. You wanted to add a thought? Um, I lost it. It's gone. Uh, all right, there's, there's also musicwriter.biz. Okay. Another site I have. Okay. We're, we're going to have you back because there's so many delicious things in here, and I'd like to leave our audience um, with the thought that uh, Bon Jovi, uh, but not the artist Bon Jovi, uh, wrote in the book, and he said, it's the song you're selling and the musicians who are playing it. That's what this business is all about. And... Uh, that's one of the things that I've always said, and I wonder when the record companies are going to get it and, and start putting A&R people and producers and the people who select the music who know what a good song sounds like, as opposed to good production, because you, you can have great production on a terrible song, and it ain't going to sell. That's it for today's edition of Sam Brown's For The Record, and we thank all of you for joining us. If you'd like thank to hear this, Sam. thank you, Hank. If you'd like to hear this show again, or you'd like to share it with a friend or listen to the previous editions of Sam Browns for the record, go to kpfk.org. Click on audio archives. In the left menu, once you're there, you can listen online or get our podcast. Or you can email me if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, criticisms, complaints, or clarifications on this afternoon's program. And I'm at s brown kpfk at aol dot com. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Carlton. Happy New Year, everyone. We'll see you next week. You've been listening to Sam Brown's For the Record on KPFK, 90.7 FM Los Angeles, 98.7 FM Santa Barbara. Join us Wednesday afternoon for a series exploring the lives of farm workers in California from statehood to the present. That's Pastures of Plenty, Wednesday at 2. Your Sunday afternoon music block is coming up next. Starting things off is Reggae Central with Chuck Foster, so keep it tuned. With the new car business down right now, you might think that we don't need your vehicle donation. However, the market for donated vehicles is very strong. Please donate your old car, truck, RV, or motorcycle to us at 877-KPFK-AUTO. That's 877-KPFK-AUTO. Or online at kpfk.org. We'll take care of everything, and you'll help support the quality programming you hear on KPFK. Just call 877-KPFK-AUTO. That's 877-KPFK-AUTO. Or donate online at kpfk.org. Looking for a place to rake your brains and shake your bones while visions of sugar plums dance in your head? Well, then let your vegetable presence stay right where it is and tune in to The Music Never Stops every Sunday night from 9 to 11 p.m. for weekly doses of Grateful Dead concert tapes, contemporary jam rock, local freakiness, and miscellaneous psychedelia designed to lubricate your mind. 
I'm your irresistibly charming host and imaginary friend, Barry Smolin, inviting you to light up a Sabbath candle or whatever it is you light up on a Sunday evening and partake of this hippie head space, our little niche of bliss here in the nether sphere. That's The Music Never Stops, Sunday night at 9 on KPFK 90.7 FM, Psychedelic Radio for the universe and elsewhere. Thank you. 